This is Wednesday, June 10th. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we are looking today at uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, responses, education funding related to um, CRF funding. And a question came up yesterday. There were some concerns about um, summer uh, lunch programs for families. And uh, in conversation with the chair of human services, they are taking a pretty strong uh, role in this area. So I invited um, Katie McLean, who's been, who's been drafting the legislation there to just give us an update on what they are doing so we can see how that fits with uh, our concerns. So Katie, thank you so much. I know your time is limited. Thank you, it's nice to see you all. So I have a document that I think really can pop up on your screen, but I should just say as a disclaimer that um, while Human Services has been talking about a lot of these issues, I haven't looked at the language yet. They've been talking about the ideas and concept and I've been kind of tracking their conversation and putting language together as we go. So this is language um, that is likely subject to change once the committee has a chance to take a look at it. Thank you. So Julie, if you could bring that up, thank you. Okay, so this language probably follows the format that you've been seeing where in our first subsection, we're, ha we're adding the appropriation. So right now we have the sum of 12 million. Again, that's a placeholder um, and there's gonna be further discussion about the particular monetary amount. But 12 million is appropriated from the Coronavirus Relief Fund to the Agency of Education for distribution to summer meal sponsors in fiscal year 2021 for the purposes of continuing meal delivery services to children during the summer months, June, July, and August. In subsection B, we have the rationale for that um, particular expenditure. So the General Assembly determines the expenditure of monies from the coronavirus is set forth in this section as necessary to provide meal delivery services to children, including the preparation, packaging, and delivery of meals, and is due to or resulting from COVID-19 because food insecurity has increased significantly during the pandemic and settings otherwise available to provide meals during the summer months may not be available. The appropriation shall assist in the payment of costs incurred by sponsors to address one or both of the following. So first, compliance with COVID-19 public health precautions. And then secondly, accommodations of, uh, to accommodate increased participation in the program due to the increased number of people, uh, eligible participants who are impacted by the negative, negative economic effects during the public health emergency. So that was subsection B, the rationale. And then in subsection three, there's been a conversation um, about the possibility that the state might be receiving federal funds for the summer meals. It depends on whether or not we're able to get a waiver for certain provisions required under federal law. So there's this language about, um, I guess, not double dipping. So um, provision of summer meals to children um, is not compensable under this section if the same costs or expenses or a portion thereof have been or will be covered by a federal grant. So that's saying if the federal money comes in, then we're not, we're gonna use the federal money for that purpose. We're not gonna rely on the state money. And then just, just before I got on this call, um, there's another kind of side conversation of maybe adding language to the subsection C, maybe as a subdivision C1, that said something along the lines of, um, directing the agency of education to continue to work on getting the waivers so we could draw down some of those federal funds. So that is language that may or may not be added as we continue to move forward. And that's it for um, the language right now. That's, that's where Thank I you. And I'm gonna, Peter, get a bag in just a minute. I just wanted to clarify, I also understand that the tra transportation committee is looking into some funds for transportation. Is that your understanding as well? For, for food? Um, I, I did receive word that there is some portion of transportation's 5 million that would be put towards this particular proposal to pay for the delivery of meals. Uh, I don't know what amount yet and I'm, I'm not sure if the committee itself knows the amount yet. Thank you. 
Peter Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Kate, good morning. And, and Katie, thank you. And unsure who this is for, but this uh, I'm I'm talking about deconflicting uh, of because I I absolutely agree with do it, with continuing to do this. I just want to make sure that we aren't delivering um, two meals for the same same child at the same time to the same household. And I'll give you the, the reason why I am asking this question. So I had an opportunity to uh, I inquired of my local Meals on Wheels group here, and they invited me down to take a look. I was stunned by the, the geographic area that they serve because they are in St. Albans. They are in um, uh, Bellows Falls. Uh, and I can't remember where else. They don't cover the whole state, but they, they go a long way. Um, they, the meals were fabulous. They actually gave us two meals to bring home and the lasagna we had, I would, I would eat that. You know, I would expect to get that in a restaurant. The marinara sauce was wonderful. So plug for, for, for Meals on Wheels. Um, talk to one of the drivers who was, was delivering meals to folks that are, are being uh, housed in, in hotels in Rutland uh, who are otherwise homeless and said, so how's it going? And he said, you know, it's going pretty well. Monday through Friday is okay. Uh, but on the weekends, um, people will throw away most of the meals that I deliver without even opening them and consuming any. So my, um, what I'm wondering is, um, are they... But are those individuals where there are children involved, are they also getting the, the meals delivered from school at the same time that Meals on Wheels was delivering? I don't know if anybody can answer that, but it's a question I just want to posit and, uh, and uh, see if we can get answered at some point in time. Because one of the things that the uh, speaker charged us with was deconflicting, right. you know, making sure we only spend one dollar to do one thing and not one dollar from here and one dollar from there, both trying to do the same thing. So I'll leave it up to somebody if anyone can answer that one. <laughs> I, I, we do have some meals and wheel. No, excuse me. We do have um, some of the folks from Hunger Vermont here. I don't know if they have an ability to answer any of that. Um, um, yes, Madam, Madam Speaker, if you want me to answer now, I can answer that question partially. This is a Nor Horton from Hunger Free Vermont. Thank you. You want me to proceed? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So Representative Fagan, um, you are accurate that there has been um, a bit of a challenge in organizing who, which entity is going to be providing meals at which times to the folks who are being housed in hotels. Um, who, who are normally homeless. And uh, that does include some homeless families with children. Um, but um, I've been involved with other, other key organizations and the state emergency folks um, in, in sorting that out. And I think in most places in the state, any duplication of effort in, in those programs has been alleviated. Um, there, it was just a bit of a challenge about um, which entity was going to get a contract with uh, the state SEOC to cover those meals. Um, so I do think it, you're absolutely right that it's so important to avoid any duplication of effort with these precious funds that, that we have, and, that, and that's critical. Um, in terms of the summer meals program, there will not be any duplication of meal provision. That, that cannot happen because every sponsor uh, must register with the Agency of Education and be approved, and they will be covering a very set geographic region. And our challenge at this point is to get the state covered. I mean, we're going to, you know, that's going to be a huge issue, um, and it's getting greater, uh, a greater challenge every single day that, that we delay, but there won't be any duplication of meals. I can guarantee you that. Thank you, Anor. Um, my... If it had come down to it, I would have said I'd rather feed people and, and risk the, the, the food going to waste. I really hate to say that word out loud because I work very hard in my own family to make sure we don't waste anything. But you know, if we can deconflict, um, all the better. So thank you, um, Peter Conlon. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, just a couple questions. Uh, first of all, is the um, Agency of Education okay with being the ones in charge of this money distribution? Uh, my understanding is that summer meal programs are generally federally funded programs that operate independent of um, kind of the regular year school system. And I know 
the pandemic has thrown everything into a bit of a different situation. Um, so I'm just curious to know sort of the interlinking between the agency of education, federal programs, what's already going on in schools. And then I basically hope, and there's nothing in here to, to address this, but that we will not be delivering meals during the summer using giant school buses. Um, and you want me to respond yeah. to that? Great. Yes. Um, so um, you are correct, uh, Representative Conlon, that the Summer Food Service Program is a federal program. And I do want to be very clear that, um, that we'll be getting, there'll be a significant amount of um, federal funding for that program coming to Vermont. Most of the waivers that, that we needed to obtain from USDA, the Agency of Education has successfully obtained. And so the costs of food, um, the costs of much of the labor to prepare the meals will be covered by federal dollars. Uh, what, what is never covered by the federal program um, is the cost, it would be cost of delivering meals because normally the federal program congregates kids in a place and gives them all the meals in that one place. That's how it normally works. Um, and there'll be additional costs for PPE, additional costs for packing meal, packaging meals to go, which again is not the normal way the program works at all, and some additional labor costs. So I, I just want to be clear that this will, there will be a significant portion of this program that will be covered by federal funds. And the Agency of, of Education administers those federal funds for the summer meal program. They also are the agency that trains all of the summer meal sponsors um, overseas that those sponsors are operating properly and using funds properly um, and, um, and works to, uh, in partnership with some private, with some nonprofits like Hunger Free Vermont, works to recruit sponsors and make sure the program is operating well. So um, I do believe that the Agency of Education is the appropriate agency to handle these funds since they do deal with all the rest of the claiming and disbursement of federal money for this program. Um, I realize that Katie, Katie has another meeting to go to. So um, I want to thank you for sharing that. It sounds like we can get the rest from other folks that are in the room, but um, I am pleased to hear the work that's going on in the committee. Um, we have, we have certainly have backup funds to, to cover um, CRF, but if, if the, if the focus can be up there and, and I'm really pleased to hear that they've taken on the summer program. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, nice to see you all. Yeah. Um, Larry, did you, I just saw you hit, raise your hand. Or are you just waving? <laughs> um, Sarita, Austin? Yes, hi. Um, Anur, I, I just wanted to clarify uh, something. In the past, the summer meal program was a universal program. Is that correct? Like there, there were no limits in terms of who was eligible, all children could get it. And then in this, um, it looks in the, in the new proposal, it, 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 it increases eligible participants, which is wonderful. I'm just wondering, is that different than the uh, past summer program where all kids were eligible? Um, thank you for that question, Representative Austin. Um, so the, in normal times, the summer food service program um, operates in a way where communities have to be um, eligible for that program based on the percentage of low income children in their community. And if the community um, could demonstrate that during the school year, 50% of children attending that school were eligible and enrolled in free and reduced price school meals, then that turned that entire community, the whole geographic area served by the school into effectively a universal summer meals program where all children, any child age zero to 18 could be served summer meals at no charge to the families and the school 
or the sponsor of the meal program, whoever that was, would be fully reimbursed by USDA for each meal served. And then in communities that didn't hit that 50% threshold, they couldn't operate a summer meal program in that way. And the only kind of summer meal program that those communities could operate is what is called by USDA a closed enrolled program, meaning that if there was a summer school or a summer camp or something like that, where they could demonstrate that 50% of the children in that program were using the free and reduced price school meal program during the school year, then they could serve all the kids mm -hmm. in that program universally free summer meals. So that's how the program operates. And um, that's the one waiver we're still trying to get from USDA. Our agency of education is still trying to get, which would be to make um, the summer meal program universal everywhere in Vermont. So we don't have that waiver yet, but many more towns have qualified right. to be able to provide an open summer meal program because of the collapse of our economy and so many people being out of work and, and all the lost income. So even if we don't get that waiver, we will be able to serve a very large percentage of children um, with the summer meal program this summer if we have the ability to deliver meals to them. If we don't get that funding, um, if the school districts, I mean, it's not Hungry Free Vermont, if the school districts and other sponsors don't get um, that funding from the CARES Act funds, um, that 12 million, that's, that's what we're looking at um, to say that that's what we think it will take to really be able to fully cover the whole state with summer meals. And part of that is for transportation. Part of that is um, to cover additional costs, um, as I said earlier, that, that it is gonna require to safely package meals, to have enough staff to cover increased demand, things like that. Um, but another part of it is to address the fact that not all school districts are, are willing or able to continue providing meals over the summer. So we're going to have gaps in where summer meals can be provided um, by school districts. And we're gonna need to quickly find um, other nonprofit entities who are willing to sponsor the meal program in that area. And then we're gonna have to find um, entities who can prepare the meals and vend them to that program. And we're thinking that perhaps some local restaurants in different communities in Vermont could, uh, you know, we could have a win-win-win here, right? And, and we could get um, restaurants I'm sorry, the F-35s are, dry, are flying over and it's gonna get very loud. So, um, but, but, so does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna thank you. myself for a second. So just, just to, um, what I'm thank looking you. for right now is, is the committee comfortable um, with where the, the other committee is going and so that we can move on to things that actually we need to be covering. And I'm looking to um, Caleb Elder um, to, to respond at this point. Thank, thank you, Chair Webb. Um, I, I, I am very pleased to see this proposal from Human Services. I guess what I'm keen to understand is um, because money has not gone out to school districts yet, uh, I just, um, I would appreciate uh, our own funding being written in such a way that it also um, can be used for these um, qualifying reimbursements so that um, while I see the 12 million that we've just been hearing about from Katie and, and um, from House Human Services that that might be more about transportation and logistics for this summer. And I just want to make sure that we're also saying yes, but we know you had kind of FY20 costs, which may be for food service and can also be reimbursed out of um, the bill that our committee has in front of us. Um, I don't think those things are duplicative. To me, they just um, provide potentially different channels for the different um, moments in time over which this crisis has unfolded. Um, also, just with your permission, I'd like to just read something from our superintendent about our summer meal program. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, yeah, let me just, let me just, I, 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 I just wanted to say, I'll keep it to yeah. one sentence. Um, yeah. uh, it's fine, <laughs> I was just gonna have, 
Jim respond yeah. first, but go ahead. Just saying, without factoring transportation, the meals during COVID have actually been revenue generating. Since we are operating as if it were summer meals, we are reimbursed at a higher rate per meal than normal. And so what this emphasizes is that it's not the food that is, at least in our district, putting a hole in the budget. It is the additional labor that has had to be moved to the food service sector. And it is particularly that $4,850 $4, per day we're spending on transportation. So thanks for letting me share that. It was just something from the field that came very recently. Well, I wanted to have Jim respond in our language that we have, if it's COVID related, it's a permissible, uh, our, our language would allow for that, correct? Well, that's true only in subdivision A1, okay? Uh, A2 and A3 would have to be broadened. Um, so, and some of meals, um, I'm not so sure that's, hmm. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think if, if you want this bill to cover certain, certain meals, I think we need to be more expressed on that, on that point. Because um, it's not usually, I'm not sure about if it's a usual school district cost or not, given that it's there are federal funds and transportation. I, I'm not sure. So I think to be cautious here, I would encourage uh, some language on that in this bill. And But in terms of um, money that has already been spent, that in our A1, that is a reimbursable expense if they're not able, if they're not using the, the 12. I believe million. it would be, but again, we could add language in the bill to make that express as a, as a permitted ex expense. Peter sure. Fagan, did you have something? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I'll get used to putting the hand thing down sooner or later. Yeah. Okay. Um, chip conquest in approach. Um, how are we doing here? Just um, you, you, I'm not quite sure what you mean by how are we doing. <laughs> yeah, just checking to see if you had any questions, remaining questions before we move on. No, I mean, I, I think Peter mentioned the, the thing earlier that um, is on my mind is just, you know, making sure that um, that in, in all the good work we're doing that your, your committee is doing here, um, that um, we're not duplicating efforts elsewhere. Um, I would I, I appreciate um, Ledge Council's suggestion about being um, specific in these areas for things you want to cover. I would just again, you know, make sure that um, in when the language is very broad, that we're just being careful that we're not, you know, spending the money uh, in on the same thing in in different areas. But. Okay. Thank you. Um... So uh, just trying to figure out what we want to do with that language. Um, do, do people, do, do, we need to, do we need to add that language, folks? Kathleen? And then we need to move on to higher ed, so. Yep, <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, I agree, I think we do. And don't we also still need to add language making more clear what our tier one and tier two um, priorities are. I, I remember discussing that yesterday with Chip. Can, can, I, can I just address that maybe? Um, it's useful to have uh, preparations here for this question. I'm not sure what form. Um, maybe the bill should focus on tier one only and the communication on tier two should be through Chloe's chart, if that's okay with the appropriations. Or you could do both in the bill I'm worried about a little bit worried about timing uh, in terms of yeah. language. So, my understanding would be that um, yes, we want we want clearly what you want in tier one um, spelled yeah. out just in the form that you're doing here. Um, anything for tier two could come as a list. It doesn't need to be in in sort of bill form like this. Um, and you know, we'll be acting on tier one immediately this week, right. um, and the other things we'll be um, taking up later if you know, if and when it's the right time for that. Okay. Um, I, I, I understand, uh, Anora, you have a, a couple more things that you wanted to say. Is it something that you can send to us? Because we're just running out of time here, I'm afraid, to, to get this document forward. 
Yes, I would be very happy to do that. I just mostly wanted to make sure that you did not require any additional clarifying information from me about the different places where school meal programs had incurred costs or, or are likely to. I think uh, just quickly, my understanding, my sense here is that um, 12 million for summer is, is great. And if the um, you know, Health and Human Services Committee is going to take that on, that, that is great. And the funding that you all are working on um, would be to make school meal, would, would be an among many other things to cover costs that school meal programs have incurred as Representative Elder was describing. And also to look ahead to um, what's gonna be required for cafeterias and schools to do in order to prepare for safely providing meals in the new coronavirus environment when schools open in the fall. So I think the, the more flexibility that's provided in the way the funding is set. Oops, of course you just froze. Um, Brad James, you, as for the agency, you are gonna be providing guidance that will include, I'm assuming, guidance related that will include um, meals. Is that possible? I hadn't thought about meals per se, because I think I, my understanding was that that is under a different funding source from USDA as opposed to the, um, I, I mean, my guess is that the ESSER money could probably be used for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% certain on what I've read in the CRF money. So the, the money that we're really kind of talking about your tier one and tier two. I'm not clear on, as I read that, whether it says food is allowed. It does talk about food delivery. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about it as, as I read it, and this is from the U.S. Treasury guidance, it says expenses of actions to facilitate compliance with COVID-19 related public health measures, such as expenses for food delivery to residents, including, for example, senior citizens and other vulnerable populations to enable compliance with COVID-19 public health precautions. I think you can make an argument that, and again, I'm not an attorney, and so this needs to be vetted and run by whomever's making the decisions as to what is an allowable eligible cost, but I think you can make an argument for the fact that, that because schools are closed and kids need food, that delivery of, of the food by school buses is an eligible cost. Okay, um, I'm gonna need to move us on. We've got more to talk about. I have the ability to do some shifting of money. I know that um, the superintendents and school boards association have some requests on, on language, which you need to get to, and we haven't gotten to higher ed. So uh, Representative Elder, I'm gonna give you one last shot. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, just with an organ and cut off there, I just wanted to draw our attention to what she had said uh, yesterday evening. It would basically take section A1 and two and combine them in effect. I think the benefit of that, in addition to calling out maybe food delivery uh, specifically, according to what Brad just said, uh, the benefit of doing that would be twofold. One, it would um, have the Title I allocations apply to the entire 40 million, which I think addresses the problem you mentioned yesterday with well-organized districts not getting out in front. It would do it for all the money instead of half of it. Uh, the other thing I think would be beneficial is I'm not convinced that 20 million is enough to cover the uh, FY costs incurred, especially if it's transportation through the month of June. Um, I hope it is, but in the case that it's not, I would like the full pot to be available for those already incurred costs um, prior to forward-looking costs. So um, yeah, that's my final comment. I mean, I don't know if anyone yeah. sees the logic there, but that's, that's what I'd love to see happen. And we, we will have an opportunity to do that. Um, I, I had hoped that we could get this all done in an hour and it's just seeming like it's we aren't gonna be able to do that. Um, I have, um, I'm just trying to figure out how we're gonna do this <laughs> before we meet at 10.30. Um, and Julie, you have to leave at, at uh, 10, is that what my understanding? I can be here until 10.30. Okay. Um, we need to look at the higher ed portion and then I'm just checking to see if um, we have, no, we don't have, um, I, I'm gonna need to get uh, Jeff Francis in the room again, Julie, um, if you could send something out to Jeff Francis and, and Sue 
um, from the uh, school boards association, that would be great because they have they have some recommendations for language change. And Jim, did you get the recommendations for language change from them? Okay, good. I did, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have, um, I think we have Sophie here. Um, and I think we have UVM here as well. Do we have UVM here? We do. Richard. Okay. Richard Kate. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, so we are looking at funds and just to the committee, I just want to be clear on a, a couple of things as I went back and looked at where we are. In the Budget Adjustment Act, H 953, uh, we applied some uh, COVID dollars to the Vermont State Colleges to the tune of $12,500, million to cover 2020 costs related to rooms, meals, distance learning, equipment, et cetera. And to UVM, we gave 8.7 million. Then in the first quarter budget, we gave 15.258 to the Vermont million to Vermont State Colleges and another 15.355 to UVM. So we have some significant money that has gone to higher ed. Um, so it looks like we've got um, to the Vermont State Colleges 20, 28, 28 million and to the University of Vermont um, 23 million, I think. So I just want to make sure that we understand that. And as a result, I am going to suggest that we reduce some of the money to um, the uh, Vermont State Colleges and, and move, move some of that money over to availability for pre-K-12. So now that I have the two <laughs> higher education folks in the room to say, I'm considering with the committee at the moment, we have 10 million in our first tier funds, uh, considering moving that to five. And this would allow for a little bit of the room that I think Representative Elder is talking about. And I think Dylan, you had a comment. No, you don't, okay. Um, okay, so uh, Sophie, um, you sent an email uh, talking about some of the ways that you would be able to spend this money. And I also would like if we could pull up the, um, the, the draft of our bill. I think it's one point, is it 1.2, um, Jim? Yeah, so um, I, that I think is, I think it's on our, our, on our calendar. So Julie, if you could pull that up. <clears throat> Thank you. And if you could scroll down, um, Jim, where is it located? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, right here, subsection B on my okay. eight. So at the and, moment. And, and sorry, Kate, uh, uh, Chair Webb, because we're not dealing with tier two, the only relevant language is, is B1. Yes. Okay. okay. So at the moment, this is the language that we have um, with. 10 million, so so. excuse me, Jim, I'm just a little bit confused. So you're saying we're not dealing with, with D2? Well, yeah, because we're taking tier two appropriations out and using Chloe's chart. So uh, B2 will come out of the bill. Oh, okay. Um, so it's just B1 that I think you're focusing on now. Okay, okay. And that will happen with the, um, for the, for the pre-K 12 as well? Yeah, we'll be taking out uh, A3. Okay. And we're talking about collapsing A1 and 2. Well, there are different fiscal years and different yeah. language. So we should talk about that and make sure we know okay. what we want to do. Okay. So I just wanted to give um, Richard and Sophie a chance to respond um, to this, this language, um, particularly given what I just said about money that's already been appropriated or is in the process of being appropriated as it moves through the through the legislature. So I just wanted to make sure that I understand. Um, so 
the we're talking about uh, well not 10,000 but 5,000 between UVM and the VSC but it's for FY20 which is ending in a three weeks here is that correct so we would need to adjust that Jim? so is that what we're talking about is fiscal year 20 or are we talking about fiscal year 21 I, I think the draft is talking about 20 but that could be changed to 21 of course so okay we yeah, want to give you till December to spend it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I was going to say one of the challenges would be, um, you know, trying to do this within the next three weeks because, as you noted, um, we don't yet have the money um, in the Budget Adjustment Act bill. You know, hasn't been signed by the governor yet, so we don't have it. But um, that would just be one of my concerns: would be having three weeks to spend the additional money. Um, I went back to the colleges to see, because as you noted, we already have had um, COVID related expenses um, recognized um, in, in the two bills that you mentioned to you know, 27 million approximately um, in additional funding. Um, so th I think some of the costs that the, the colleges are working with like for protective equipment and things like that are more expensive than they had originally envisioned. Uh, the other piece is, um, those uh, requests that were submitted did not include the cost of testing because at that time it wasn't clear whether that would be an expense um, the colleges would have or whether that was something the state was going to cover. Um, and I know there was an additional 55 million um, you know, under CARES for testing. So those costs had not been included before. Um, my sense is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that the Legislature is really interested, particularly with the Vermont State Colleges, in trying to figure out ways to support the Vermont State Colleges um, with the bridge funding moving forward. And there's a limit to what you can do with COVID relief fund uh, money that would help the Vermont State Colleges. So one of the things that in, in talking to the, the colleges that, that might be helpful and, and also help address um, support the colleges moving forward, i.e., maybe reduce the amount of bridge funding that would ultimately be needed would be if there were ways to use this money to help support the students. So if we can support students using uh, coronavirus relief money, um, that would that would help enrollment, which then in turn would also help uh, the colleges financially and, and hopefully reduce the need for bridge funding. So I would I would just put that out there as being a, a possible route um, for using um, coronavirus uh, funding that could ultimately help the colleges deal with the financial situation they have. We do have in what I had emailed to you um, previously, for example, from CCV, um, they they were saying that they have already gone through or they're, they're currently getting quickly through the CARES Act funding that was used to provide support to students to help them with childcare, transportation, housing and food. Um, if there's a way we could use um, some of this money to, again, help support students to enable them to continue in college or to come to college in the fall, I think that would that would serve two purposes um, that could be beneficial. I think you, you had about uh, two billion, I think, was what you thought it might. That was specifically for CCV, right? So that but that same logic, I think, would apply to the other colleges as well. I don't have a specific number for the other colleges, but um, probably something along the lines of the money that they've the amount that was allocated through the cares act uh, originally may you know maybe we could use that as a a rough guide guide but i can also find more information and provide that to you it's just been a very short time frame with a lot going on so i apologize i don't have more concrete numbers uh, for you on that we understand I know, <laughs> i'm sure you do I'm trying to do um peter fagan did you have a something yes thank you kate um so one of the things that I that I don't know if I emailed or mentioned, you lose track, um, as far as potential use for additional CRF money being applied to the uh, our institutions of higher education, UVM and the Vermont State Colleges, would be to uh, buy down the tuition costs for students more. That might just make the difference in somebody deciding to return or to show up to begin with and not. In other words, if we can take the cost of education, at least for one semester, off the plate as far as concerns, you know, they'll still be concerned about, about coronavirus, et cetera. But if we can take the cost off the plate, it just might make the difference and students might return. So, so Jim, Jim Murray. Just to respond to uh, Sophie's comments, um, 
this language is broad. Um, so if you look on line um, 11, it covers uh, coronavirus costs incurred. Uh, so it's basically any, any qualified costs. And that's clarified in the, on the next page. If you could scroll down, uh, please, to sub section C, scope of guidance. Um, oh, actually, that's about guidance issued by, that's actually for K through 12. But the idea of this language, which we should look at, Later is um, that the guidance issued shall allow for use um, of the funding to cover all costs permitted under law. So I think we can expand that to, to cover the um, funding for higher education. And I, I would note too that Jeff Francis had language like this that he sent yeah. over that we should look at as well. Yes, excellent. And I think that they're coming into the room now. I've got to go, uh, sorry, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, Richard Kate. Hello. Oh, hi. Good morning. Good morning. I was um, wondering, I think we sent in the, uh, the table that was in a letter I sent to Representative Fagan some time ago. Um, I don't know if it'd be helpful uh, for the committee if that was displayed or not. Um, um, it, so, uh, it Peter illustrates Baker. our spending. So, um, Julie, could you look on the um, appropriations website and see if you could find a, a memo from Richard Kate? Actually, it was sent to this to this committee uh, yesterday. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, it, no. It's on our website, Kate. It is okay. Yeah. I guess I've missed it. So maybe Julie, if you could bring that up. And Jim, I, I've seen your, your hand up. I'm assuming that that's not accurate. <laughs> Jim stepped away. You may want to mute yeah. him if you can. Excuse me? You may want to mute Jim as well. I heard him step away to go attend to something else, but he left his uh, yeah. audio on. Okay. I'm, he just got muted. Thank you. <laughs> If you could scroll down to the, uh, so it's just a table being displayed, I appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, this table um, lays out, and as uh, you were saying earlier, um, it shows the, um, the breakdown of the 8.7 million in, in the earlier request. Um, and in terms of the ability to spend uh, money allocated for FY20, uh, that will, will not be a problem uh, for us. Um, if you look down towards the bottom, there, there are many other costs. You know, I, I think uh, as Representative Fagan was mentioning, um, our core need going forward, uh, there certainly are many, many costs, but one of the biggest ones is financial aid. Uh, we expect a significant additional need on the part of students uh, because of the economic circumstances associated with COVID. And uh, we're expecting probably another thousand students um, to ask for adjustments in the coming weeks. Uh, and so that is where we would, uh, that would be the first place we'd be putting any additional money that would be coming in quickly uh, to, to essentially um, reduce the uh, net cost of tuition, which of course is what really matters. So I don't, uh, I'm open to any questions you have. I don't, I don't need to take a lot of your time. I know you're scheduled so all the issues. So to clarify, um, should should the two bills passed out of the House, the Budget Adjustment Act and um, the first quarter budget, which would give you an 8.7 and a 15.3 million, uh, you could be using those funds to cover these issues? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then having a little bit extra would be helpful as well, I'm sure. Uh, yes, absolutely. There are many other costs. And, and again, I, I expect we'll drive the, the majority to, to financial aid, but uh, we obviously do, as indicated on the table, we're going to incur costs around testing and facilities modifications and a host of other things as we go forward. We also, there's also um, an additional $5 million for VSAC. So hopefully that can help as well. That would be uh, welcome, certainly. Okay, any questions for UVM or um, from state colleges? 
Hey, can I ask a clarifying question? Please. Um, so this is a very helpful chart. So I'm seeing about 8.7 million in total through uh, the end of the fiscal year. So when we're talking about tier one money, um, those costs clearly were all incurred and could all be offset with tier one money. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're saying maybe those numbers would grow because those other student expenses would also count as potentially FY20? Yeah, what I'm saying is, is we, we would be able to drive uh, any additional funding into, into financial aid uh, within this fiscal year. Uh, just, just in terms of accounting, we can, we can deal with it. It would be benefiting students that are coming uh, in the fall, but we, we can roll it through uh, very quickly. And so for the, um, well, I'm sure that number is growing, but the 6.3 that is uh, for t the academic year 2021, um, is any of the money that I, I know is not there yet, but that was in the Budget Adjustment Act, can that be applied to any of this? I'm just trying to understand how, um, how that money in the Budget Adjustment Act can be, I guess, applied to any of this money, this entire 15 million. Yes, yes, I, that's my understanding. Okay. And, and I do need to clarify that beyond this table, there are several boats. Uh, maybe you can scroll down below the table here for a minute uh, that talk about other costs. And, and one of the key ones is where you see it says, it, uh, I'm sorry, if you roll just to the top, yeah, where you see it says additional financial aid. We talk about another 20 million need, uh, at least in, in additional financial aid. So it's a combination of the table um, and, and these other boats. Uh, our costs that we expect to incur. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Peter Conlon. Uh, thank you. I just need some clarification and then a question. So Kate, you outlined money that UVM and the Vermont State Colleges have received within the BAA and the first quarter budget it, was this money uh, above or in addition to their usual annual appropriations or is this uh, what they you know would, would normally get when we appropriate state monies to them? This is over and above this, the, the uh, general fund appropriation. Oh, okay, thank you. And so therefore uh, it looks like um, uh, about 24 million to UVM um, but the chart here kind of comes up with a total of 15 million. So it seems like everything is well covered by the appropriations here. Would that uh, maybe be if, if I could just interject, it, uh, it's the table plus 20 million in uh, financial aid and some of the other bullets that, that follow in this memo. Okay, and that brings me to my final question. Um, is CRF money going to financial aid um, an allowable use? It, it's my understanding that, that it is. I would say that that is the question that we have too. So, I mean, similar to UVM, the, the money that's already been allocated um, to the VSC, both through the Budget Adjustment Act and, and what's currently under consideration for the first quarter con transitional budget does not um, explicitly include financial aid support because I think coming out of the original CARES Act funding that came directly to the colleges, it was clear that you couldn't use it for that. You could only use it for these emergency grants. So we did not include support, that kind of support for, for students. So with this additional money that you're talking about now, I think that's it. If, if we're permitted to do it under, um, you know, because there are different rules for the use of this money. And that's a question I have. If, if, if we're allowed to use this money that you're you're thinking about appropriating um, for student aid, going back to what Representative Fagan said, I think it would be enormously helpful um, to the colleges because it enables us to hopefully boost enrollment and bring students in that might otherwise uh, not be able to attend in the fall, which um, would then benefit, you know, uh, help reduce hopefully the bridge funding that we need. The, the previous amounts that have been um, appropriated or are under consideration for appropriation for coronavirus related costs, those don't help the VSC deal with the budget challenges that it has, the underlying issues. It helps deal with the unexpected, unplanned for COVID costs that we're facing. Um, but if you have additional money that you're looking to 
to appropriate um, if there's a way that that could be directed to students and that's a permissible use under um, under the CARES Act for the, the, these funds, that would be enormously helpful. So it, it, would it be fair to say that if the federal government issued a ruling saying, absolutely not, you cannot use CRF money for financial aid, that the money that's been appropriated thus far has and kind of con will continue to cover the main unforeseen expenses that you've had as a result of the um, coronavirus? Yes, because the money we've we that's we've already presented and, and is being appropriated is not going to student aid. Um, so that wouldn't yeah, that that those were all again, and you can see just on the chart that's in front of you from UVM, those were the things that we we also requested because those were the things that were sort of directly related um, to to the coronavirus. If we're able to provide funding to students in some way, either directly um, supporting tuition or if there are other ways to support students um, in terms of um, housing, food, you know, emergency medical care, et cetera, the other things that I believe are permissible uses, that would be that would be helpful. But if, again, if there was clarification that we could use it um, explicitly to help um, students financially attend uh, colleges and universities, that would be ideal. But I'd, I've, I've not been able to find in the research I've done a, a clear answer on that. Thank and, you very much. And I would uh, add that the original, um, our, our original version of the um, table showed uh, aid that we would drive towards financial aid. And so when it became a question for the initial appropriation, we pulled that back out and, and that's when we turned it into a, a separate bullet uh, in the below the table. Um, the need is certainly there. Uh, and I too hope that there's a way to clarify it at future use, but we won't have any trouble spending the 8.7 million on eligible purposes. Jim Demery. Yeah. Um... My, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, sorry. Um, just to mention the way the language is set up, first, um, as I mentioned, it's very broad. So if it's COVID related, uh, the colleges could use it uh, for that purpose. And second, um, it's in the language to the back of the bill that is more generic uh, to the appropriations language in the budget. But this language that says, any person receiving a grant comprising monies from the coronavirus relief fund shall use the monies only for purposes that comply with the requirements and there's an audit requirement. So in terms of determining whether these financial aid costs are eligible or not, that's really up to the colleges to determine um, and then to um, eventually uh, kind of have, have confirmed. But that's not a call that you need to make because uh, the bill will allow them to use it for whatever purpose is permitted. Thank you, Jim. So, um, committee, can we take this document down? And I just want to check back with the committee. <clears throat> so, um, and given given where we are right now, um, the funds that have gone gone forward, uh, are we where where are our thoughts on reducing our moving 5,000 out of our tier one funding, 5 million out of tier one funding to pre-K 12. Are we comfortable with that or, or not? Uh, comments? Sarita. Yeah, is that just for public uh, pre-K or is that private as well, that money? We've left it for, we, we're assuming that the um, other committee is dealing with child care facilities, wh which house pre-K programs. Okay. Ours, ours is looking at pre-K in public schools. Um, just in terms Thank of, you. yeah, the, my question related to, okay, I'm gonna suggest that we, we move 5,000, 5 million from um, tier one for for higher ed to the pre-K 12 
And um, if anybody disagrees with that, <laughs> I know Peter Fagan is sitting there. <laughs> I know that Chip is sitting there and they represent the two different factions in the-, in the um, So this is, this is uh, Madam Chair Kate, yeah. uh, thank you. This is the, the, uh, you know, the policy committee's recommendation. And so I, I really try very hard sitting in appropriations not to um, not to Budinsky and, and yeah. try to override the policy committee's recommendations. Um, so, uh, you know, this is this is your call. Uh, I do know that uh, that the economic driver of getting our students that are going to our institutions of higher education here in the state is huge. And uh, and anything we can do to entice them here this fall would be a real help to the state of Vermont. So is the intent here, and I'm sorry, I've, I've got an emergent uh, a constituent issue that I'm working on literally as we speak. Um, is the intent here to, to, to reduce the 10 million down to 5 million and then split it somehow between the two institutions? Right, which could gotcha. be 50, 50, or it could be zero. I just five, wanted, or it could be. Because I was working, I wasn't sure what, what it was. I just wanted yeah. to understand. I'm not going to weigh in on, on you know, what I think you should or shouldn't do. That's okay. the policy committee's uh, piece. So, Okay. Thank you. Um, Caleb Elder. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this makes sense to me in that um, the bill purports to address pre-K and, and hasn't been called out in another section. And also because it seems like the college is at least for covering um, – costs incurred in FY20 appear to be covered, I'm in support of potentially making up this 5 million in the tier two money and, and trying to find that 20 million in the tier two money. But it does seem that in tier one, we really, as we've heard again and again, we need max flexibility for that allocation. Um, and I think the pre-K through 12 um, kind of weight that this bill would have at, at the configuration you're proposing, I, I think is appropriate. And it doesn't seem to me that it leaves um, the higher ed with kind of unpaid reimbursable costs from FY20. So I'm, I'm in support of that. Kathleen. You know, <laughs> it's, these are really difficult decisions that, you know, you wish you were sitting on top of the mountain and you could see where everybody's costs and exactly how much money we all had to parcel out. And, and you could just, you know, look at it from, from 30,000 feet, but um, you know, seeing as money has already gone out the door or is about to go out the door for, for higher ed, I, I just feel like this is our shot to get money um, to the, to the public schools um, now and that they have been doing, you know, incredible work. And um, I think we need to prioritize them in this bill right now. So I support it. 50-50 or 3-2 or Jim, I saw your hand up. Is that still? No, okay. 50, um, Lynn, Bachelor, Bachelor. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with Kate and you and uh, Mr. Elder. I just think we need to help pre-K and this is the place to do it. So I'm, I'm with you guys. So 2.5, 2.5, 3, 2, 1, 4, 0, 5. Recommendations, I'm gonna throw on the table two and three. Could, could you clarify that, Kate? Is that two yeah, UVM? I was just asking for clarification as well. <laughs> two UVM, three to the Committee on Education. No, three to, <laughs> three to the Vermont State Colleges. And, and um, what's your, uh, what you're thinking behind that? Well, I'm looking at how it was given out, um, how the, it was addressed in the Budget Adjustment Act of 12 and 8. Um, and thinking about the, the likelihood of a little bit needier students um, at the Vermont State Colleges. I think that sounds like- uh, Give it all to the Vermont State Colleges. What was that? 
Oh, sorry. Can, can we give it all to the Vermont State Colleges in this round? It's up to it's up to the committee. Richard Kate. Can I ask a question? Uh, as, as we think about money going to financial aid to students, uh, fine line. Uh, uh, there's a. Uh, I guess I'm having an inner debate about: Do we need to clarify that is to only go to Vermont students? Um, and that's opening up a whole can of worms, which I probably don't have time for right now. An appropriate can of worms to discuss. <laughs> that's right. Richard Kate, can you deal with it being three two or four one or? How about zero? <laughs> so we, we would obviously prefer a 50-50 split. Uh, we understand that it's the legislature's prerogative. Um, uh, I can assure you uh, we can make good use and, and was indicated earlier uh, by Representative Fagan, um, we do believe that our activity is an economic driver for the state. So we're hopeful that what we do with it uh, would, be, would be appropriate uh, for for that purpose as well, um, I'd like to think of it as an investment. And the question there are to issues them. around how it, um, the allocation gets driven in terms of Vermont students, that's fine. You know, that's, that's not an issue. So you're comfortable with us saying for Vermont students and, and as well, Sophie, you as well? Yes. Yes, we yeah. would be because we, we, we serve predominantly Vermont students, about 85% of our students are Vermonters. Um, and again, I would um, obviously respect what the committee decides to do, but my my hope would be that providing this kind of support to students would ultimately decrease the the amount that we would need in terms of bridge funding because it will hopefully boost enrollment in the fall, and that's really what the bridge funding is is going to be needed for us to in order for us to continue. Is we really need to have the support um, due to the, the the loss of enrollment while we while we transform. Okay. Um, Kathleen, then we're going to need to tie this up. <laughs> no, you're good. So, um, Jim, can you um, make that for Vermont students? Um, well, I can. My, my concern is we're not sure if it's even an eligible expense. Yeah. So I think Okay. one approach here could be to leave the language as it is have uh, the colleges just determine what is an appropriate, what is a permissible expense for uh, financial uh, aid. And they could decide to only use it for Vermont students as they seem to want to. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're recommending that we just leave the language and that can get sorted out. And I think that there's an interest in serving Vermont students anyway. Um, Three, two. How about, how about give me some blue hands here? Um, if you don't, are you okay with doing three and two? Put, raise your hands if you are. And, okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got, I've got, I've got a majority. Um, is there anything, is there another number that folks wanted? Um, can I just say something? Yes. Um, I, I, I almost would like to split it because a lot of CCV students transfer to UVM um, and do very well. Um, they transfer in their junior year. Uh, so, I would like to give them tuition as well. I'm fine with the three, two, but I also would be fine with 2.5 for each. We aren't, we aren't sure what's gonna happen with tuition, I think is what Jim is saying, whether that's gonna be allowable or not. Right. Um, Larry? No, I, I think that, you know, I, I think there's a very fine line how this, these allocations for tuition if they're eligible or not, um, you know, that's, I guess it's something we're going to have to look at. But I also, I also look at the discrepancy um, between the tuition at the University of Vermont and the tuition at, at um, Vermont State Colleges. Um, 
So, you know, my concern is that balance. Um, UVM certainly does have a higher tuition rate. Um, so you, what would you recommend? I'm well, going to have to Mr. Closer. I'm almost, closer. you know, I'm almost thinking that maybe we should just split it. Um, split it. Yeah. Okay. Chris Maddox. Make it even, even playing field. Chris Maddox. I see the hand, but I can't hear you. <laughs> hey, Chris, you're, you're muted. There you go. Can, can you hear me? Now yes. we can, yes. All right, sorry about that. Um, I was just wondering, what's the split? I can't remember off the top of my head for uh, state funding to UVM and Vermont State College, because I would recommend just splitting the five million that same proportion. Do you know Peter Fagan? That way everybody. Kate, this is hard. I've literally got this person who is who is outside the Department of Labor building. I'm trying to get her in. She has huge problems and they literally <laughs> drove up the Department of Labor and the doors are locked. So I'm, I'm doing this all at the same time. What was the so question, please? The, the <laughs> question is how, how are, in terms of our appropriations to the Vermont State Colleges and, the, and UVM, um, yes. how is that split in our general appropriation? Um, off the top of my head, normally UVM's appropriation is approximately $42 million and the Vermont State Colleges is just shy of $30 million. And that's off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, so just to, if that's what you're looking for, those, those are the numbers. So that, that's like a 58% to UVM and what is that, 42 to Vermont State College? I'll take you, Chloe, yeah. can answer that more quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what you're recommending a little more to UVM? Well, if it just lines up with what we do for an appropriation anyway, and Coop makes a good point about the, the differing of tuition costs, so I'll just throw that pitch out there. Okay, I'm going to go back to 50-50. <laughs> works. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in with a counter and just say, you know, the general fund appropriation, we got to remember UVM is more than just an undergraduate four year liberal arts college it, that, it, that also funds um, extension, medical college, uh, uh, other things that are not necessarily student related. Um, I think given the fact that our state college, I'm going to make a plea back for the three and two given the fact that our state colleges serve about 85% Vermont students. Um, and our goal here is to get more Vermont students enrolled in our state college system. Uh, and if we can use the money for financial aid, uh, I think that the, uh, the three and two I'm more comfortable with, but I'm not gonna hold up anything over that. Because it'll probably back. get adjusted, it'll probably get adjusted in the appropriations anyway. Yeah. Three, two. Just shake your heads. I can see you all. Three, two. Yes. Yeah. Three, two. Okay. Three, two, Jim. <laughs> Three, two, Vermont State Colleges oh. to UVM. And now we have absolutely no time, but we do need to actually hear the recommendations from um, the superintendents and school boards uh, related to language changes that Jim fortunately has seen. Um, and um, if we could maybe bring up um, the recommendations that they sent, uh, that should be sent to Avery. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> so we're gonna have to basically go, yes, you know, comments from Jim on, on each one. Um, Peter Fagan, can you mute yourself? Okay, he's good. Okay, and Jim, we're going to want your your comments on this as well uh, as we as we go through each one. Okay, so who would who would like to speak? I will. This is Jeff Francis. Can you hear me? Yes. Our goal was to be as clear as possible with regard to our recommendations, so you can go right to two. 
So the first recommendation is that language be added in A1 that directs the AOE to provide reimbursement funds to school districts equitably and in a manner that is not based on a first come first serve basis. That assumes that the reimbursement funds are a finite source and it's intended to give, we'll say the less well-equipped supervisory unions and districts the opportunity to, to not get cut out of a process based on their administrative capacity. Very tricky. <laughs> Let's come back to that one. I think the okay. others and that's intent language that we know that the AOE would have to work the system out. We just think they should be directed to work the system out. Number the next one, number three. Um, we talked with VASBO overnight, and they want to make sure that there's maximum flexibility. So the suggestion there is that language be added to explicitly state that the AOE shall not impose eligibility restrictions for COVID-related reimbursements or grants in excess of the eligibility requirements set forth under the Federal CARES Act. You've heard from Brad that that is not their intention, but we think given the magnitude of this program that it, it is useful to actually have it in the law. So stop right there. Jim, comments on that? Yeah, so on that one there, um, I, I'll just read you the bill because we can't get, to, I don't think we can have two things up on, at once, but that's the reason why we, we have subsection C currently in language. Yeah. Um, so this is a different version of that. Um, the, the language currently in the bill says, uh, consistent with the say purposes of funding under subsections A and B, you forget about that for a minute, uh, it was, says the guidance issued by the Agency of Education and the agency that will be administering for higher education shall allow for use of that funding to cover all costs permitted under law. So it's a different way of, I think, expressing this point um, that it has to be very inclusive of everything possible. Um, so it's a question of which language you want to go with, and maybe Jeff has a view as to, maybe, the, he, maybe there's a view of this, suggested by, um, by Jeff is doing something else, but that's, I, I see them as being somewhere at least, so. So Sue Siglowski's on the line. I think that, and I'm not an attorney, I want to disclose that. Um, the, I think that the reference to law in the language you just stated, stated Jim, uh, could be, um, it added to by making sure that both the, that is the federal law that we're talking about, not the state law. So the, so so our interests are making sure that the, the eligibility speaks to all available uses under federal law. Um, so I, I don't know what the best drafting is, but we wanted to make sure we didn't lose that point. Well, the, the, the under law is designed to be very broad. So it's under law, meaning all laws. So it's state and federal law. So I, I, I use that phrase to be, again, very broad. So I'll defer to the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, if you'd let Sue comment if she has one. I'm yeah. appreciative of Jim's response and I'd defer to the committee, but also understand that Sue as an attorney might have a comment. Sue? Uh, I would defer to the committee as well, uh, but I think that it would be um, it would be helpful if it was specified that uh, we're talking about the the Federal CARES Act, um, but certainly could discuss that with Jim. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly uh, in the current language I could do whatever you want, but in the current language. I could change it to say uh, under law, comma, including the CARES Act. So I could just call that out if that makes you more comfortable. Yes, I think that would be great. Thanks, Jim. Okay, committee, if you have problems, let me know. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, Elsie's also with us. She may well, have an additive comment, but our intent in number four. So yeah. one of the challenges of navigating navigating uh, this entire endeavor 
it has to do with timing and clarity. So when we discussed this after your discussion yesterday, we thought that it would be useful if there was an explicit reference in the bill to the Agency of Education's responsibility to issue clear and timely guidance on the use of the funds. Um, to, to Brad, I, I, he might have had to leave. I can't remember I can't tell if he's still here. I think he had to leave. I believe that's the last point, Jeff, right? Are you making? Uh, there's one or two other, there's one more, just one more point, number five on page two. Okay. Because at that point, we're talking about that. Yeah. This, and number five is the simpler point, and it was actually brought up yesterday, and I'm not sure whether it was in response to something that Caleb Elder said, or Jim, whether you made reference to it, but if you take a look at A1 versus A2, A1 talks about the cost of reopening schools. Uh, excuse me, A1 talks about coronavirus costs incurred by schools. A2 talks about the cost of reopening schools. And we think that the, that the broader coverage, coronavirus costs incurred by school districts, actually has utility in A2 because school districts are gonna be engaged in COVID related expenses that are legitimate eligible expenses, but may not be um, literally reflective of the cost of reopening schools. So we thought that the same um, explanation that exists in A1 should be um, transferred to A2 as well and, and replace that reference to the cost of reopening schools. And then the final point six, I think you've already discussed, it was just our thought that uh, the, 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 the bill might benefit from the elimination of tier two references. That's advisory from us and we certainly defer to the committee on that. Those are our comments. And so let's go to five. That's the full extent of our comments this morning. Let's go to five, Jim. Uh, and then I think this stage to pull up the bill language if we could. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Let's pull up the bill bill language, and while we're doing that, um, and it's one point two, I think, thread on our website, Julie. And Kathleen, did you have something? Yeah, just about the. Um, I think it's a really good idea. I, I've lost the section we were looking at, but I think it's really important to include a timeline for um, expenditure funds and issuing guidance. And I just want to clarify, um, I, I remember that the AOE is going to issue very clear guidance to the schools on how they can spend these funds. And Brad is back in the room, so. <laughs> yeah, but we said earlier today that no guidance will be provided to um, UVM and the state colleges. I was wrong. Sorry, I'm sorry about Peter. I was wrong about that. It, that language in the book does cover the uh, UVM and state colleges. So okay. I, was, I was incorrect. Okay, so they will also be provided clear guidance. Uh, not AOE necessarily, but whatever agency appropriations think is appropriate to administer that, they will be providing guidance. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, so there. Okay, can we go up in the bill, please, to um, subsection A? And yeah, um, great. So A1 and 2, let's just talk about differences between these two sections because there are a number of them. I'm not sure whether there should be differences, um, except for the fact that A1 deals with fiscal year 20, A2 is for fiscal year tw 21. So that's one difference, obviously. Uh, A1 covers all coronavirus costs. A2 is a narrower set for reopening schools. A1 is a reimbursement program, A2 is a grant program, and A2 has, requires the most um, a school or supervisory unit could get is their proportional allocation of Title one fund funds. So there are a number of differences here um, that I'm not sure they need to be here. <laughs> um, and so I thought we, maybe we should just talk through that. Um, yes, thank you. We've been talking about, this has been 
in the air for a while. So yes, please do. One by one. So first of all, we're reallocating money, uh, 5 million from higher education into um, pre-K through 12. So my first question is, is that 5 million going into fiscal year 20 or 21 or both? Let's put it. Let's put it into 21 okay. until I hear otherwise. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, uh, second question is the scope of coverage. So to um, just point, A2 is more limited um, and it can be expanded to be like A1 and cover all coronavirus costs as opposed to just costs for reopening schools. Just, just one quick question on, on uh, A1. Um, those can get pushed forward into, into A2. In. Yep, I'll put the language in. Yep. Okay, great. So, so anything left over from fiscal year 20 will be able to be used in 21. Yep. Then I suppose it doesn't matter where the, <laughs> well, no, let's put, it in let's put it in two for the moment. Okay. Oh, Brad James, did you have a comment? Yes, yes. My, my comment is on um, the $5 million that we're talking about at the moment. Yeah. And it references what uh, Representative Fagan said yesterday. Um, it seems like we keep talking about more and more costs, possibly in FY20, that need to be reimbursed. I would suggest putting that $5 million, that additional $5 million in FY20 for the reimbursement. If there's anything left over, then have language that says any money left over from that rolls forward to FY21. I think if you don't do that and you find you need more money than the 20 million that's in there in FY20, you're gonna run into a problem. So let's put it into FY20 and then it can just roll forward. Okay. Unless I hear otherwise. <laughs> okay. So yes. the second question then I think uh, is whether a two should be drafted like A1 and cover all eligible coronavirus costs rather than limiting A2 just to the cost of reopening schools. Um, I, I think that the, I, I, I like the language that the um, school boards had recommended. Anybody else comment on that? I like Brad, that page. Can you scroll down a little bit so we can see? You're talking, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on line 12 and 13. If you go up for a second, sorry, go up to A1 first. Go up uh, a little bit in the bill. Scroll up, please. Um, thanks. Um, so it's on line six in A1, A1 which says uh, reimbursing fiscal year 2020 coronavirus costs. That's everything that's eligible. And then if you go down to line 13, it's only the cost of reopening schools. So Brad, James, and then Dylan, then Serena. I'll, I'll be very quick. I came back on just as Jeff Francis was finishing up, so I'm not certain what they said, but I would recommend that you make um, that, that reopening of schools much more broad and allow it to be used for whatever eligible costs. Okay, thank you. Dylan? Yeah. Um, I think I would agree. One of the areas I've been interested in is ensuring that districts could apply for reimbursement if they had to hold an all mail election. And then we know that we still have about a dozen districts. So it is conceivable that some of them in a, um, you know, in a frustrating way might not be able to get their budgets approved before the close of the fiscal year, in which case they would be in 2021 and you would want the flexibility to be available there. And as I read, a1, it appears that that could cover elections that take place in fiscal 20, perhaps, um, but I'm not sure it would be covered later. So for me, I think making it broader uh, and allowing for more eligibility would cover that and would help other areas as well. Thank you. Sarita and then Caleb. Just, I, I agree with broadening the language in A2. Thank you. And Caleb? I'm just wondering what is the function of gating off the the money in the two stages i'm, I'm just i know i'm not going to advocate for putting it all together because i've already done that but i don't have a big problem with this but i'm just not understanding why we wouldn't just make it all one big pot for eligible funds with max flexibility over the entire date range of 
March 18th to December 31st, 2020. That's actually what you're doing. Um, because you oh, can <laughs> carry over the funding in um, 2020 or 21. So basically, the fact that it's, it's, it's for fiscal years, I don't think it's that relevant for use of funds. I see. Okay. But it's still written kind of as the sections. Is that right? Uh, well, we'll come, I, I can come back to how it's written. Um, I might be able to combine this in, in a way based upon a few other points we have to discuss. Um, but well, if the effect is the same, that's that's all good. I didn't understand that. Thank. You. So when we're done, Jim's gonna gonna redraft, and then hopefully we're just gonna find a time to meet. Um, to the, Jim will send it out to everybody, and um, we'll hope, hopefully get to it before floor. Um, Chelsea. I don't. Um, oh, Chelsea Myers, VSA, for the record. Um, I don't want to put Brad on the spot, but I think he did explain at one point the reasoning between dividing it into reimbursement for FY20 and, and um, grant funding for FY21. And maybe that would be helpful to hear because I think as an association and our members would also like as great a flexibility as is possible. Brad? I think for the FY20 money, um, everybody agrees that the reimbursement is the correct way to go. It's one, it's simpler for us. That's not the reason to do it, but it is simpler for us and it's faster for us to get the money out the door. And um, it's already it, spent. <laughs> and, and it's already spent. In FY21, part of the concern is that if it is a reimbursement process and there's only a certain amount of money, some districts that, that know what they have planned already and will spend their money quickly may draw down more than for lack of a better term, and I don't like this term, but I'm going to use it anyway, they're a fair share. Um, that, that harkens back to Act 60. Um, um, the, uh, the, we, I think a, a, a grant program in FY20, or 21, pardon me, makes more sense because that way districts will know what they're, what they're going to be allocated. Um, I, you know, we, the, this draft still hasn't allocated as a, out going out of the way Title One goes out, so they would have a rough idea of what they're what they're going to be have available, um, with the potential of more money being available later. However, this all plays out over time. I guess I would just say that if we put most of the money in the first category and we know it's going to spill over to the second, that would be the safest thing to do, and that way we don't risk underfunding the FY. I, I, com I completely understand what you're saying. I would say, and again, grants are not my forte in the agency of education, but I would say that th what that would mean is we would not know how much money we are offering, we can offer people if we put it all into FY20 and waited to see what was left over. We would not be able to tell them what they're going to get in, in grants. They can't, that means they can't draw against those grants until the grant is done, which would mean that we would need to know how much money we have, which would be somewhere probably the end of July at the earliest, I'd bet. Um, and then that's when the, we then have started the grant, start the grant writing process. And that in, in and of itself takes time. I take your point, I see. So they each get to look at what their title, title numbers are, and then they can very quickly figure that out. Right, once yeah. I need to send them the percentages, but yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I think so far, if I'm looking at the list, we've addressed. Have we addressed? I have one, one more, uh, I believe, yeah. um, Sir Webb, um, which is um, if you look at the language on lines 15 through 17 for A2, uh, to the point just raised, uh, it's a bumper basically. So it, it's, it's around equity. So they can only get uh, uh, grant funding up to their proportional allocation of Title one a funds. So that limits um, and makes it sure that there's some equity here. That language is not in, in A1. So, it's not, so there's no bumper like that for the reimbursement. So you could add that language into A1 to be sure that Burlington or some bigger school district didn't get all the money uh, as opposed to Wyndham or something. And that brings us to, I think, the first point that Chelsea was concerned about, which is um, in the uh, point two, 
that directs the agency to provide reimbursement funds equitably. Yep. Love that word equitably. <laughs> um, I, and I guess it's, is there a way to do that that doesn't have to tie it to something that lets them use their judgment? <laughs> well, if you put the bumper in here, like you have in A2, yeah. I think that addresses equity. Um, and you're not mentioning the word equity, <laughs> which might be good. Um, so it's an approach. I'm not sure how um, how the bees would think about that, but that, that might be an approach to, to addressing their concern. Yeah, it, it's it's a challenge. I, I guess I'm I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about the difference between physical structures and students and students and student learning is definitely, Title I is very, very relevant, but then there's just um, sheer number of students in the larger districts, um, sheer number of buildings. So I, I don't, I don't, I'm, in, I'm personally inclined not to tie, to tie it to Title I, um, but I, I want to give the agency flexibility. But Brad. This is without having thought it all through carefully. Um, if we were to allocate the FY20 money out and say they get up to a certain number, whatever, whatever schematic we chose, um, that would then run the risk of some districts not being able to spend all their money and other districts not being able to receive all the money they've spent on reimbursements. I do not know individually what districts have spent at this point, nor with the other things we've been talking about, such as personnel costs being included and, and eligible, what, what those numbers are going to be. If you have a situation where a district has does not spend all of its money allocated in FY20, that money rolls forward to, to FY21. If you have a situation where a district has costs that were not reimbursed that were eligible in FY20, once we go into FY21, I don't know if there's any way to go back and give them money without special legislation from you guys um, to, to, to close those books for FY20, FY20 without a deficit. And we certainly so, so, I, so I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is I think if if we were to if you were to look at an allocation methodology for FY20, I think there might be problems with that. Um, I'd be interested to know if if Jeff and Chelsea have thoughts on that, and or if Sue has thoughts on that. And I think we we also know that at the moment you're predicting it to be kind of in the ten, and we're already providing twenty five, so that there's there's some room for money that's already spent. Right. The, the 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 ten the ten that I'm predicting is are are the costs not person not salaries and benefits then. right that that's that's the additional money that we were talking about um, earlier this week and, and last week I think yeah talking to somebody last week anyhow any um Chloe and then Peter Conlon yes I I actually I just raised my hand did it work it did <laughs> oh good um, <laughs> I would like to offer something as well, sort of just thinking of, um, about this FY20 reimbursement um, sort of bucket. And I completely understand um, the idea of wanting the funds to go out equitably, but I also sort of want to um, follow up on what Brad was just saying that we don't know exactly what expenses schools have already incurred. And it's kind of like, you know, what's, what's done is done to some extent, and we don't want them to go forward into the next year with a deficit. Um, Brad has also, there's been some discussion um, about the fact that we're hoping to, you know, put out this guidance and sort of start a communication with the districts about um potential staff costs that might also be eligible for reimbursement. Um, and, you know, initially, and I, the secretary actually spoke to this yesterday um, and spoke to the idea that there might be potentially, you know, $6 million of staff costs out there that are eligible for reimbursement. Um, if that in fact proves to be the case and we um, get comfortable with, 
the language and what we can spend the money on, the more money we can push out to districts in FY20 that cover, um, let's call them general budget costs, such as teacher salary and staff time. That is actually um, money that will um, be able to flow through. So say, you know, you are able to cover a million dollars of staff costs with CRF money in FY20. That money will be available as a surplus in FY21 if you make those changes and um, will help the education fund picture. Um, so it will essentially reduce the, the funds required from the education fund in FY21. So if that's the case, then we are you know, working with districts and we're finding that there are these eligible costs it's possible that this can be part of the $150 million education fund problem. So conceivably additional funds could be made available. Does that um, make any sense? <laughs> so just to, to clarify, um, if I'm understanding it, you're suggesting that we not add, um, that, that we, we not add the recommended language about uh, in, in there, point two that we leave it I am suggesting uh, I'm suggesting that we do not add um, we do not add any limiting language on the FY20 appropriate reimbursements thank you Peter and, and then Brad too uh, I was just going to say that the reason we have the limiting language um, of the title one funds was to make it duplicative of uh, ESSER money. And the only thing that I would say is that um, we just need to guarantee that every district will get at least the amount they would be getting under ESSER, since the idea is to replace ESSER with CRF funds. Uh, this is Jeff Francis. I have a thought that may be helpful. What if the, and this is for Brad, is, the, is my audio working okay? Yes. What if there was a date by which the districts needed to submit their reimbursement amounts and that all the reimbursement amounts were collected and then looked at in terms of the way the reimbursements were paid? So presumably, if the reimbursement requirements were less than the allocated dollars, there would not be any problem with reimbursing them. And if they were in an excess of available reimbursement dollars, the entire picture could be looked at so that it's not a first come first serve. It does not suppress the submissions, but it gives the agency the latitude in the event the reimbursement requests exceed the allocated dollars to look at it on that basis rather than any other basis. Making it complicated. <laughs> um, Kathleen James. Um, I just want to say that I, I, it may make it a little bit more complicated, but that, I, I don't know if you saw my hand go up and go down a little bit earlier. I did. But that, well, that is exactly what I was going to suggest. And then I was like, no, oh, I don't know if that's such a great idea. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. And I wish I kept my hand up. Okay, well, you did in a sense. Um, Brad? Brad James? Uh, oh, and that's his lower James. hand there. Okay, there. Um, that, I, I was, as, as I was listening, that's what I was starting to think too. So Jeff, Jeff beat me to that. Um, the question I would have, which, which we have to think about, is if, if, the, if the reimbursements were in excess of picking the number we have right now, $2.5 million or, or $25 million, if they were in excess of that, um, the first thought I have is then you would, we would know what everybody's asking for, then you would simply prorate out what they're asking for versus what, they, what they're able to get. In other words, if it was $27 million that they get, well, let's make it 30%, $30 million cost, they would get 25 over 30, which is five six of what they, were, what they had spent. Um, you can ignore the math, that's fine. Um, but that would be prorating out what, what they had spent compared to the amount of dollars that we have available. 
um, that would treat everybody equitably. That would still leave a, 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 uh, an unreimbursed expenditure that they had made for, for COVID in, in, in uh, FY20 if, that, if we did it that way. Um, I'm, I'm certainly open to suggestions that that was just off the top of my head though, if that makes Jim sense. And then, Jim and then Chloe. Yeah, so I, in terms of dates here, um, just- and We're just, on the floor in two minutes. <laughs> oh, just me yeah, talk about dates. If you have dates here, I think you need a date for the guidance to be issued a date obviously for um, for reimbursements to be requested and a date to pay them. So we need three dates and also the proportion, pro proportionality language that Brad suggests in case those reimbursement amounts are higher than 25 million. But um, in order to move forward on that, I, we have to talk about dates, I think, um, what they should be. So think about that, Brad and Chloe. And then we're going to have to end, but I, if we can, if we can get this last piece together, I think Jim can draft. Um, I would just like to offer, um, and sort of in conjunction with the dates, sort of conversation as well, that if um, it is found that reimbursements, re requested reimbursements in FY20 exceed twenty-five million dollars, that. Um, the agency reports back to the legislature in August and um, consideration can be made about appropriating additional funds. Nice. <laughs> um, Peter Conlon. Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. Uh, however, I will say I like what Chloe just said. Yeah, simple. <laughs> Uh, are, are you comfortable with that, um, Chelsea and Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. If Flora's not at 1030, when is Flora? Flora's at 2. <laughs> two yeah, right, Kate. It's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Right? 2 o'clock. Okay. okay, so we're still okay. I thank you to it. Time flies Angel. when you're having fun. Yeah. Guardian was... Angels, it just reminded me of that. <laughs> So confused. If we could stop before two, however, that would be appreciated. <laughs> that would be very good. <laughs> so can we talk about the dates? Uh, yes. So first date is the date by which guidance has to be issued by AOE. Like tomorrow, is that okay? Um, Chloe, is your hand still raised with a thought on this? No, I didn't. I forgot. I'm I'm a bad bad uh, zoomer. Okay, and if you if you have some ideas, um, please let us know. Brad, when can we when can uh, we do this? Yeah, tomorrow would be great um, because I know <laughs> the sooner the better for them. Um, I, 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 I can't promise anything, but I would say I think we could probably get something out a week from today at the, at, and hopefully earlier. That would be my suggestion that we try that we aim for because we need to get out as soon as possible. There's no there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And you're obviously going to be working on it now. Yep. Um, you say June 30 because yeah. it won't even be enacted until yeah. a week from tomorrow. Yeah, so guidance, guidance by the 26th is a Friday, 30th is a Tuesday. Brad? I'm, yeah, I, I think, I think I'm pulling up calendar. Um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, if we, if we aim for Friday the 26th, if that, okay. I, that gives us some time. Is the guidance, Brad, that you'd be issuing under A1, is that the same guidance you'd be issuing under A2 for the grant program, or is it different? Pretty, pretty, pretty much. I mean, we're, we're, cha we're changing the language in two to make it more broad, correct? We are. Yeah. Okay. Then, then I mean, the, the, the criteria are not changing, as far as we know, anyway, from, from the federal folks. Um, they're, they, they are what they are already with the things that we're questioning and asking about. Okay. And then the second date is what date, what's the date by which the reimbursement requests have to be submitted? Uh, 
I would, I mean, if we're, if we're putting official guidance out on the 26th, I would say, I would say, I was going to say the 15th. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's realistic for them. Um, and then we're gonna have to turn it around as quickly as possible and get it back in and, and work on it. Um, so the but I would, say, the I would say the 15th at the latest because we're starting to get pretty far out there then. Yeah. Okay. And then payment by when? You said payment by when? Yep, payment by when. Th that I don't know. I would have to check with um, the accounting office on that. That sometimes takes, that can sometimes be quickly, sometimes not. We would have to look at these, make sure that, that, that they do, that they are what we, what they do follow the guidance. Um, because we, the, again, like I said, like I said before, the last thing we want is when these, when these monies get audited, we don't want to find out that, that it was not an allowable cost and have them pull so when, money back. Yeah, but you will be looking at budget adjustment in August, is that right? Uh, probably. So I'm just trying to think that we need to have that before that, before that, if we're looking at the appropriating more funds. Yeah, I mean, what we would- The e, e, e board, whatever. Yeah, we, we, we would certainly, if, if everything was into us on the 15th, we would certainly have a very good idea of, of a maximum amount. Um, yeah. For FY for FY twenty, um, but I, I think I think we need we need to probably a week to go through it and to process on our side at, at the bare minimum. Um, so I'd, I'd hesitate to put a date in there certain as to when we have to when it will be paid out. I think you say as soon as possible. Yeah, it's not strictly pretty light legislative language, but yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how we relate that to the fact that um, we might be portioning the decisions to portion yeah I, I i mean again as i said if by by the if if we have the numbers on all in on the 15th and they're they're um aggregated then we could tell them on by the 16th whether whether it's going to be portioned or not as, as soon as the numbers are aggregated i can tell them okay we just got to put in a date jim I mean, uh, sorry, Chloe Wexler here. I don't know that you need to put in a date certain for payment of the funds. Okay, good. I, I mean, it doesn't seem, I mean, before December 30th, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I and I know that obviously you want to get the money out there, but this is for the reverse, the reimbursement account, right. you know, so they will be getting those other, um, those other funds made available to them in a grant. Um, and once they know that they're getting reimbursed for their funds in terms of their books, it's, it's better, you know? Okay. So I just don't know that there needs to be that specificity. That I'll, I'll put that, I can put down as soon as reasonably possible, you know? Okay. Okay. Because I mean, that's, that's what we'll do. We, we're sure not going to sit on this. No. Okay. We certainly know that. All right. So we got that nailed down. Um, yeah. So we're probably report back if it's over 25 million total guidance by June 26, submit by July 15, and payment as soon as reasonably possible. So I think we've got that nailed, um, hopefully. Um, another co question I've got is the carryover. So if there's um, carryover funds from fiscal 20 into 21, um, uh, is that are those carryover funds into 21 used for reimbursement or are they going to be used for the grant program? I'd assume the grant program. I, 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 yeah, I, I would presume the grant program. Um, okay. Are we there? <laughs> uh, are we there. Um, can, um, can I just ask one more question? Yes, please, Chloe. Um, can we see the language about the surplus? I, 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 sure, I've got Brad's comments, which I can-, I can Okay, put. good. Oh, I would just wanted to confirm that um, you had received those comments and I didn't know if, you, if we needed to have a committee discussion about making those changes. I have received them and committee discussions not to me. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
committee discussion. Let's let's do it quickly because I think that that's actually was a fairly easy one, wasn't it? I think so. uh, yes, and I think it's important. Yeah, I, I think it, I agree. It is important. So let's so, let's um, review that. Explain. It, yeah. So if we scroll down, uh, please to um, F. F. Yeah. Subsection F, which is on page three, I think. Yeah. Bottom of page three. So F right there. So line sixteen through twenty. So this is in May right now. So um, this allows school districts to um, carry over surplus funds as revenue into fiscal 21, as opposed to fiscal 22. And the question is, it should, should it be shall as opposed to may? And the request, I think the recommendation was, was to make it a shall. Shall with the um, caveat that they receive reimbursement from the coronavirus relief fund to, to generate that surplus. Brad? I, I, I agree with what Chloe just said, because with the way it's written out, this is talking about all surplus funds. And I think what we want, and I think the idea, of, I, I don't know what they're doing with the surplus funds right now that they have. My guess is a lot of them are using them. But I think we want to make, to make sure that we are talking about surplus generated by reimbursement with the CRF monies. Right. Yeah, we don't want to limit their their own, you know, right. wheeling and dealing. Okay, um, Mark Pro. Um, I just wanted to check with Brad. Does that does that require them to use the surf, those surplus funds to reduce their education spending in twenty one? No, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm trying to remember all the language that's, that's tied around there. Um, is it, well, my point is, if, if it, yeah, I understand your point. Per, per, pretty much it does. I mean, it's not, it's not ironclad, I don't think. Shouldn't it be? Yeah, I mean, you do it, want to put in there to, to reduce the education spending? It's fine by me. Yeah, I mean, if it's not, then we aren't doing anything to close the gap in the Ed Fund. With these well, money. we are because we know they're going to use it, what they're going to use it for. They're not going to take this money and, and, and do something, too. They're not going to go out and say we're going to build a kindergarten or something like that. No, but they but could they, just. But I, but I think making it tighter is fine. My only yeah. comment about making it tighter would be the timing of determining their education spending um, because this, we are not gonna know their reimbursement amounts in time. Um, and so I don't know if the best, I, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not sure about the timing. This, this and this is a, gets a little bit deeper than this committee discussion, but. I'll just, I'll just throw it out there quickly. I've thought about this as a conversation that Bill Talbot and I were having yesterday, kind of off to the side. Um, about the timing of all this. And I think if, if we let people know that this is coming down the line, they will, they, they'll have a pretty good idea of what this is going to do for additional revenues for them. Mm -hmm. um, it means that we, we are currently in the process of collecting budgets. They were supposed to be due June 1, but we always give them extra time. So budgets are still coming in. I haven't looked at them yet. Um, so what this means is we would re have to reopen that and allow people to change their their budgets in terms of on the revenue side because this is additional revenue, um, and that might push back the setting of tax rates a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm I'm trying to decide if if this I, I'm looking at the time. I know the governor is speaking at eleven, and other people have things to do here. So I I want to um, see if that's something that. Um, Jim, are, are, are you able to draft something yet? I've been a little bit sidetracked here. Well, I can draft. Um, I've got just, I'm not sure if you the last point. I would, I'm not sure if you want to tie to the Ed Fund or not. So that's an open question. Uh, the other thing is, um, I confirmed with Katie, who's looking into the, um, the food program stuff. She says that transportation, she believes, is covered by CRF funds. So there's no reason to spell that out in this language. Um, if we do spell it out in language, then we start creating a list. So I prefer yeah. not to spell it out, um, given her view that it already is covered. Um, and a good language, A and A1 and 2, now we cover, we pick that up. 
but back to this question here about uh, the Ed Fund. If, if we get an answer to that, I can I can go draft. Or I can just leave that as a whole for now. Okay. Uh, Kate, if I, if I could chime in on this. Uh, I just want to be, I want to clarify, we're really talking about two issues here, two surpluses. One is um, that the carryover of the CRF money at the state level from one year to the next. And then F, which is really talking about a school district that has surplus funds, that they don't have to wait the year to use them. Um, I, th I think Mark's point is uh, well taken in that when a school applies a surplus as revenue, they do that with great caution because you then have an artificially low tax rate that will crank right up the next year. So you often say, well, if we give all this money back to the taxpayers, which then reduces the Ed Fund, um, then we are setting ourselves up for, to fill that hole the next year and that'll be challenging. So it may, if, if the goal is to make sure that that reduces the Ed Fund, we may need to put that in as a requirement. Does that make sense, Mark, what I just said? Um, yeah, yeah, that was that was the issue I was raising. And I, you know, I, I hadn't thought about the timing issues, which is why I asked Brad about it. I, I don't know if it messes up timing or not, but that was I would concern, yes. I would almost be, um, I, don't, I, understand, I, I understand what everyone's saying. And I just wonder if, because um, we are uniquely sort of defining the surplus that they have to use um, and, you know, they're trying to subsequently sort of reduce their education payment, but without really, I'm just wondering if there is a way that that can be done without delaying the tax rate settings and influencing, you know, sort of creating tax rate swings for the district. And um, the way to do that would be to sort of wait, see how much money each district receives, and then um, sort of square up on their actual education payment, as opposed to their education spending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that also gives us more time, but uh, you know, I, I, that we're sort of having like a very detailed conversation on the fly, um, so. Brad, any comments? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that that would work properly um, in terms of when I, I had not thought about what Representative Conlon had had brought up about the potential swing in tax rates. I think um, I, I was thinking more broadly and, and looking at the picture as a whole, where it would be helping the education fund in FY21. You are quite correct in saying that this could bring people's tax rates down one year, and they're going to go right back up the next year. Um, in a lot of ways, that may not be a bad idea if a lot of people have, have been having trouble with their, their jobs and are having trouble paying property taxes this year, and they'll probably fall into next year too. That might help them there. But I've never thought about that before until right now. Um, I, think, I think the, the reality of, pro, of rates kind of um, yo-yoing a little bit for a year is, is correct. I had not thought about that. I think will people understand that? I don't know. I would think they probably would, um, but I, I don't know. Whether there'd be a hue and cry the following year when rates went back to where they were normally, um, I think that could be addressed. I personally think that could be addressed by an explanation as to why rates went down this coming year. Part of I mean, not, not that was long. just, rec we need to get to recommendation on the language for Jim because we're going to be ending and I'm going to probably try to have us end in. 10 minutes. So, so I, th I think then that, that the question is, um, we, I, I believe we've agreed to the, that it should be a shall in there and that it is due to, the, um, to any surplus generated by the coronavirus relief fund. Um, the question is, do you want to ensure that it applies to education spending, which will make the tax rates yo-yo a little bit? Um, could, could I, could we maybe um, ha have a conversation and uh, with Mark and Brad and I and, right. um, I and get back to that. you? That would be great. Okay. Yep. I think that, that would be helpful. And this will give, give Jim, I want to let Jim go so that he can work on the other items. Is that the last item that we're trying to address at this point? As far as I'm aware, yes. Okay. Wow. 
I appreciate so much the input um, today. And um, I, we're gonna have to find another time to check in after, if, if Jim, if you can, you can do this and then we can send it to the committee. Okay, let me, let me do this now and hopefully I'll have it to you by the end. Yeah. Excellent. Um, shall we try to meet the committee at 1230? Is that possible? Julie, do you know if that's possible? <laughs> I don't know, but I can find Avery or I will find out for you and let you know right away. Thank you so much, Julie, for stepping in and, and helping us through this process. <laughs> and okay. Avery stepped in somewhere else, so I'll be <laughs> <so. laughs> I know. <laughs> so, Kate, you, yeah. you're thinking we get this language, have a brief meeting at a certain point in time, approve yeah. it so we can get it, we can meet our deadline. Yeah. Okay. How are we doing, committee? Well, it's difficult to say the least. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to this. We'll get through it, I'm I, sure. I just wonder if that surplus, um, if it's added to the Ed Fund, does that also include this three cent increase that school districts will be hit with to pay for the deficit spending? So the money we're borrowing, I think we're going to add three cents every year for about four or five years. Uh, no, Sarita, the three cents just represents the world pre-COVID. I don't know. Hey, Someone's no dishes. You mute Chloe. I'm sorry. <laughs> Doing something. Okay. You mute Chloe, it'll go away. Yeah. I think Chloe's so have, working if, on the Ed Fund Outlook. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I was opening my file cabinet. I With a hammer. <laughs> okay. Thank oh, you, Peter. Boy. Okay, committee. So just give me a thumbs up. Are we gonna we're 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 working on on this. We're getting close. Yeah, it's great. Kate, I think. I think we're there. Uh, just we should watch our emails for what the actual time of our meeting will be. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. And the governor's on in 10 minutes. So um, and he's got some school issues that of course he'll be discussing. Yes. Yeah. And Chris Meadows, did you want to say something? I just saw a little blue hand go for a second. No, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Welcome oh, to our Lord. Lord. Everybody's uh, pushing the buttons, you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, I guess uh I'll, I'll send a, a message to Julie and Avery about the possibility of, of 1230, but everybody watch your okay. emails. Um, okay. um, thank you so much, Jim and Jeff and everybody and Mark and Chloe and everybody working on this. It's Brad, it's, it's, we have no time to do something very large. Kate, you don't have to send us an, e I'm sorry, Representative Webb, you don't have to send us an email. I'm, okay. I'm taking care of it right now. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send and, the Zoom invitation. And Chloe Thank you and very Mark, much. And, and Chloe and Mark will get together right after this. Yeah. Do you want to keep the Zoom? Yeah, I'm trying to call you right now. Oh, is that the phone ringing downstairs? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all that racket. All right. And okay. Hey, okay. Just, just one piece of logistics. So we will not meet sooner than 1230. That's I, what we guarantee. I don't think we can. Okay. Okay. Good question. Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. That, that's that's good. Yeah, need to know. Lots yeah. of things to do. <laughs> Everywhere. Sure.